I knew that was in there somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Here we are. What is today? The 25th of October. Again, Friday night at SMC Studios. Again, Terry is hanging out with me tonight. He just had a very intensive, long... No, it wasn't that long. ...arduous rehearsal session that went on for hours and hours and uh, yeah, I'm, weeks. And I was only conscious for half of it. Yeah, time. well... <clears throat> we have... Um, it's been a good week musically. Yes, yes, it has. Do you want to, like, say why you think it has been? Well, I mean... Last night's rehearsal with Fastback was was very productive and very good. Um, and and then tonight's rehearsal with the Obscure was equally equally good. Pulled a song out of our butt which we didn't know, and it was about dirty Chinese people, right? No, clean clean Asian Americans. Yeah, yeah, it was. And uh, if that offends anybody, well, you're in the wrong podcast. Uh, so, like, uh, Fastback, why was Fastback's rehearsal good? Well, we have a show coming up. There you and, go. Uh, That's what I was I fishing know. for. You're a fisherman. A fisher of bands. Um, we got a show coming up November 2nd, and uh, we only have one more rehearsal before said show and uh and we 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 i think we did rather well um everything's coming together the way it's supposed to and um the obscure has absolutely no show <laughs> coming up and uh we're uh we're still kicking butt with that um i don't know i might I might uh, sneak them out to the show Saturday. I think that would be an excellent idea. I'm just saying. During the break, we'll we'll get up there and jam a song or two. You know, it could be like uh, like Bill Ward, I mean, like Vinnie Apice in the wings. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Type thing. Yeah. If anybody gets that. <laughs> Okay, so tonight's episode, I think we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite entertainers and mine too, uh, vocalist, singer, songwriters, what, a lot, what other things could you call him, uh, Ronnie James Dio. I'm not sure we can get all of this in an hour, so it might be more than one episode. Or, or again, we're, these these podcasts are so finely tuned and planned. Um, Agreed. Know, yeah, I'm. In my, matter of fact, we're on the stopwatch right now. But yeah, yeah, we're. It's basically off the cuff so far. We that's all we've done. So and it worked out all right. So <laughs> why change it? Exactly. So, I will guess ask you what it, what was your first uh memory, you know, or of Mr. Dio like, you know, do you have any like uh I probably have the same first memory that a lot of people did. Um <clears throat> when I uh I was over at uh, Michael Klein's house, as a matter of fact, and uh and he had the Heaven and Hell album. And it was, I mean, just as soon as he dropped the needle, it changed my life. I was like, I don't know who these people are, but wow. And uh, I barely had any recognition of Sabbath, much less Ronnie. But, yeah. I mean, Neon Nights was just explosive. Children of the Sea lady evil heaven and hell uh, and just right there just those four songs would have made that album just complete but then you get to flip it over it is just wow a great album and uh, and then fast forward a few months I uh, acquired Mob Rules and the first time I heard that 
was sitting in my bedroom alone in the dark, and that album terrified me. Really? How how old were you this time? Oh, 15. Uh, it terrified you how? Explain that it, to it, me. It was just, the music was so dark, and, I mean, just Turn Up the Night was just... I, I know that you notice that Ronnie's vocals on Mob Rules were very different from Heaven and Hell. Heaven and Hell, he was very... His voice was very clear, mm -hmm. and I don't want to use the term, but it was kind of angelic at times. Um, he was just, he stayed up in his upper register a lot, and it just, it, it was awesome. But on Mob Rules, he was a little more growly. And, it, you know, I, maybe it was from coming off the tour or whatever, but he just, he had more of a snarl to his voice, and it just absolutely made the songs tremendous i i i guess you're right i i hadn't really thought about it you know uh, to me uh mob rules always seemed like a continuation of heaven and hell uh but yeah thinking about it it, it uh yeah i always looked at it as the flip side of the same coin but it was the darker side for sure and I, I just, I don't know, I tremendously love that record. Yeah, I know uh, uh, most, Ronnie including, most people, I think, liked Heaven and Hell better. Uh, uh, but I knew, do know several people that prefer Mob Rules over Heaven and Hell. And I, and I really don't have a, a preference because I think they're... They're like this, like a continuation or same thing, and I, I think um, some of the folks I've talked to, I believe it might have to do with when they experienced it. Yeah. Uh, the guys in the band, I think their opinions are mainly due to emotional things that were going on. Uh, which happens a lot of times, and we don't have that. We weren't there, right? And we didn't, you know, experience the same things. We were in the studio. We weren't on the tour, whatever. And they have a completely different viewpoint. And we're just looking at the material and that. So, um, and, right. you know, there's a there's another thing that pops into my mind: <clears throat> uh, Dio solo album, Dream Evil. And there's a similar story there about it, and. Uh, when I hopefully remember when we get there I'll talk about that okay oh uh, my first I guess was in Rainbow I'm not sure what album it was If it, it, I, it might have been uh, there was a compilation or like best of type thing Rainbow and um Probably a mixtape. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it, it was definitely in Rainbow, uh, and I, uh, you know, I was impressed. I, I wasn't that uh, really like centered uh, specifically that I remember on him. You know, it was just the band, and I liked the songs and that kind of thing. It wasn't like, wow. Um, I mean, obviously, he's a great singer and everything, but I mean it. it I don't have that memory. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, there was a lot of music during that era. So there was a lot of other competing things to be listening to and doing and everything. The next memory I had was uh, Heaven and Hell. And I, as we talked earlier, I was my memory is I was here locally at the Civic Center to see some show. And who knows what it was? guess I could probably figure it out. Um, and I had never heard heard Heaven and Hell. I mean, it's not like anything they played on the radio or anything at the right. time. So, and and at that time, uh, a lot of times we got there early, uh, like maybe during sound check or afterwards, and they're still they're still setting up. And the front of house guys had some music playing on the system, and Heaven and Hell came on, and I was like blown away. I remember not knowing what it was, 
But recognizing the singer, and I went up to the guy and I said, hey, uh, who is that? And, you know, he showed me, I, I, I don't remember if it was a cassette tape that he showed me the cover of or what what it was, but uh, I remember seeing it and he explained, and this was, you know, uh, told me, you know, Ronnie Dio singing for Sabbath now and they fired Ozzy and blah blah and I was just blown away so that was sort of my introduction and then fast forward I guess uh, again you know a lot of their influences a lot of their music I don't really remember uh, listening to a lot of it until the solo stuff you know Holy Diver and that kind of thing uh, and again you know, it was it was great, and I loved it. But I, but I you know, sort of, I guess, a lot of other things going on. And um, I remember I'm trying to remember the date. Uh, I was at Redstone Arsenal at the youth center, and a guy brought in a tape. We're playing pool to put in there and play, and it was, um, I think, it was Dream Evil. Because I remember like Sunset Superman and those songs <clears throat> and going, oh, this is, you know, this is Dio and Mar anyway, that kind of thing. But memories get a little hazy over the time, so I'm really not that uh, sure about all that. I, now, can't, I can say real quick that <clears throat> that feeling I had when I heard the song Heaven and Hell, I mean, that overwhelming wow. I never thought that I could have that same feeling from the same singer until I heard Stargazer. And Stargazer was just, what? Are, are you kidding me right now? That song was so freaking amazing. And, uh, and that's when I think that's what solidified you know Ronnie is in is is in my DNA now and and that's when I started uh, searching out the elf stuff now that was a shock that was a little bit of a culture shock for me because I you know I was expecting high energy rock and roll and I think everybody was is was a little shocked about that that didn't experience it at the time right yeah and uh but I can tell you straight up, man, everything Elf did, I absolutely love. That first album, I think that first album is really good. I liked all three. And, you know, even Trying to Burn the Sun, which everybody acts like didn't happen, but it was a great album to me. On the Elf thing, yeah, I, I, I experienced that later, too. As I, When I became a really hardcore Dio fan, I went back and researched the stuff you know heard some of the doo-wop stuff right and then you know elf was i get the first elf album i guess was was um and and i'm i was like you i was at first i was like wow this is so different uh i wasn't sure about it and you know I, after listening to it a couple of times i was just like wow this is some cool this is totally different but this is really cool stuff yeah um Now it's coming through, right? Yeah. yeah. Making sure you can hear it too. Yeah. By the way, it's a gambler, gambler off of the first one. And I'll throw the cover up there too, of course, in post. But, um, I just wanted to add some playing in the background. Uh, and that cover is also that's Ronnie James in makeup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember uh, getting to sign it, and uh, you know a couple of uh, other things like you know Holy Diver and whatever. And I and I had that, and I go, I uh, guess it's been a while since you've seen that one or something. And he looked, he looked at me, and got that classic Ronnie smile again. He goes, No. I see it every morning when I shave. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, it took me a second. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I got you. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I'm trying to remember how I, how and when I really became just like enthralled uh, with him. And it had to do, um, I think, with this, again, with the Sabbath albums. Um, because there was a resurgence, uh, you know, in Sabbath. Like, like there is a lot of times everything goes in phases and cycles, but, uh, Sabbath, you know, it doesn't seem like that now, but there was a period of time where they were sort of like, you know, not thought of, you know, like, like. 76 to 78 they they were an afterthought yeah and even later I meant you know like uh, before Ozzy got the TV show and oh yeah you know I mean that was just a time that Sabbath was like I mean you know they, I don't know it's just in the, I noticed there were surgeons uh, and uh, I'm thinking you know late 80s early 90s uh, a lot of people started that weren't even around and stuff started uh, really getting into Sabbath, you know. Though. But anyway, that I remember, you know, listening to all the Sabbath stuff, but because that's my favorite band. But you know, Heaven and Hell, uh, you know, it just blew me away. Um, production's great on it. The songs are great. And, uh, you know, I wish I could remember, like, specifically uh, how this happened. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I decided to sort of do this tonight, because some of the stuff that were starting to get foggy. Um, but I, there was a time uh, pre-internet, really, uh, or the early days when there were uh, news groups and bulletin boards and that kind of thing. And... Uh, I was uh, involved in one of the, not one of, but the largest like mailing list news group, right? Things with uh, about Dio, and I was also in a bunch of Sabbath ones too, of course. But uh, so that transitioned, you know, over a several several years, like from BBSs to to things, and then it was like uh, uh, Yahoo groups. I don't know if you remember, like the oh, yeah. you know those things that were you know, and and so we transitioned a lot uh, over that, and uh, for whatever whatever reason, uh, I became like the moderator. I think first off, it was like co, you know, several of us because it was lar- it was very large. And uh, then finally, the sole one, or the main one, and um, started going and uh, seeing, uh, any, you know, it's whenever possible. If if Dio came wherever I was, I was living in the Midwest at this time, I think, in the uh, late uh, 80s, early 90s, uh, and uh, I don't even remember how many times I've seen him, so it's been quite a few and I got uh, and Wendy his wife was handling his management right and I don't remember how I got her number who gave it to me whatever it was so anyway I, I you know got in contact with her about uh, the after show things and you know photo passes so I would go and take photos for the for uh the group and I know this had if I remember correctly it all tied into that you know I mean because I was in that because I don't think I just like out of the blue and she just says sure you know <laughs> so, so um, and uh, also I remember doing an interview you know I talked to her about setting up an interview and I it was probably like a lot of those things you know one of the albums released or a tour or something for the promote and um, so you know he how they usually set that up or at least how they did then is like you know they have a, a rough time and they tell you well he'll call you or the secretary or assistant or somebody will call you and then you know that kind of thing so I'm, I'm sort of waiting I don't know what you know say if it's 11 o'clock or something and the phone rings and 
and uh, you know I'm expecting some intermediary and it's you know it's Ronnie wow yeah <laughs> and he's like hey is it hey is this Scott <laughs> you know like oh, so oh. cool uh, and we had a you know and I, I recorded it for obvious reasons but uh it was long too. But what I remember is, you know, because they always set up stuff like that. Even when you have, you know, photo things, they'll set up. Well, you you only can take, uh, you know, the first three songs, and then you need to quit or whatever. There's always some kind of time restraint, and uh, I'm sure it was set up. But you know, I felt real bad. He just didn't. He just likes to talk. He's just a very. Uh, personable person you know he's just he just likes he enjoys stuff you know so and and it wasn't just about the business it would be you know like uh, at the time i was in wichita and there was a big famous like cowboy boot type place there right uh i don't even know what it was called but uh you know and he had been there and he's like oh that that, that store's in Wichita, and it? Oh, I've gotten some really cool boots there. And, you know, have you ever been there? And You know, just stuff like that. He just kept on going. And I was just like, God, don't. You know, I'm not meaning to cut you off, but don't you have to go? Like I told you, know, I was told not to, <laughs> not to keep you. Yeah, not to keep you, you know. But, uh, and and I wish I still had the transcript. And it's probably somewhere, you know, like uh, archived, too. But, um I'm sure the tape's long gone, but I had somebody transcribe it for me. So, you know, it's typed up somewhere. It was really cool. I don't remember all the specifics. I did have a lot of um, uh, questions written down because at this time, I, you know, like a lot of us that are, you know, like remember back when there was no internet, you know, and, and, and you read Circus Magazine and that yeah. kind of thing, you know. I mean, that was all we had. Um, and it always seemed like any, not just him, but any, anybody like that, they always got asked the same questions over and over again, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and I'm like, don't you people ever read any, any of them or, you know, don't, uh, I don't know. And, yeah, and, it's sad. And, and to me, it would be like, you know, it would drive me crazy to get and ask the same questions over and over and over again for years and years. So anyway, I always I had things that I was interested in and people uh, in the group that I ran to that they were interested in. Because, you know, I'd say, hey, I'm going to have an interview, submit some questions. Uh, and a lot of the stuff was like, uh, you know, I remember... Like, okay, you know, you, your career is ridiculously long. You were started back in the doo-wop days and, you know, Elf and Rainbow and uh, Sabbath and all. And, and you're touring all the time, pretty much always tour, long shows. And, it, you know, you play the same, you know, you, you play these songs, perform these songs that you've done thousands, thousands of times, you know. So I always thought, okay, what, you know... What's your favorite song? Uh, uh, and I'd never seen anybody ask him that before. Never read anything about it or anything. So you know, he he didn't even pause. He was like, "No, I don't even have to think about that. It's heaven and hell." And it surprised me a little bit. You know, I, I sort of expected him at the time. Now I know. I mean, I've read it a bunch. You know, but I'm just saying. Then no, uh, and he he was. I expected him to, to probably have a solo song, you know, in there somewhere. And um, and he just he just said, heaven and hell. He said that was, you know, I remember first writing and jamming that song with the with Tony and the guys and, and the feeling. And, you know, it, it's really cool. And I never get tired. And I'm, he played, he, not that how many times, thousands of times he's sung that song. And, uh, you know, he said, I never get tired of it. I love it. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, the other side of that coin uh -oh. is there's got to be some all these songs that, you know, that you've done so many times that you just don't really like. I bet I know what that one is. Yeah. Well, I didn't. At this time, <laughs> I had never read this before. And of course, I've seen it a bunch of times now. And it surprised me, too, you know. And he says, well, he says, I'll tell you, I... There's only one, and I, you know, I wasn't really surprised there too. And he said, because, 
because I never let myself. I, I, I was was in a situation that uh, that uh, there were uh, people in the band had votes, so to speak, too, and I didn't like the song when it was recorded. And I didn't like it when it was released. And, you know, I don't. So he goes, <clears throat> and they overrode me. And I, you know, he said, but I've never let that. I've never let me myself get in that situation again because I've never recorded a song or whatever that I didn't like. Right. Uh, you know, and boy, that really threw me. And, you know, I'm thinking, like, what could it be? And, and okay, and he goes, uh, it's Rainbow in the Dark. I know, it's just so crazy. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> that was like your first, like, hit. Uh, yeah, you know, solo. It, it probably bought his house. You know, and he goes, yeah. He And he's like, uh, he said, yeah, we were in the studio. He said, I really didn't like, you know, it just didn't come out the way I wanted it. It, it was too poppy. And I went, you know, it is sort of poppy, but it's just po catchy poppy. It's not right. like bad poppy. And he goes, he says, I literally was running to the machine, the 24 track, two inch tape with a razor blade. And I was going to cut the tape up. I was just going to cut it up because I didn't want anybody to hear it. And the guys physically restrained me. You know? I could see that. And and they talked me out of it, man. This is our. This is the first thing, you know. They were telling him that, and he said, obviously they were right. I was wrong, but he said, and he says it's grown on me over the years, you know, <laughs> like that. Uh, and of course, I, I uh, at the time I didn't, you know, didn't notice, but I'd read later, you know, seen this story later on, of course, and uh, you know the the. The cool hook in the song is the keyboard part, right? You know the dun 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 dun, and that and and that wasn't on the original. That uh, Jimmy Bain, the the bass player, which also played keys, he they were in there, and he came over and picked that out, and and that became to me. I mean that history, made, yeah, that became the song. But uh, you know, I still don't think it's a. I think it's a great song. I don't. You don't like it, and I don't like it. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I, I, I really don't have any uh, until probably there's a few on Sacred Heart, and there's a reason for that, which maybe we'll talk about later, right. and uh, that I don't care for, and the you know the Tracy G, G era, and I love Tracy. You know, he's a great guy super talented but it it's uh it's just uh, a lot of those songs are different there you yeah know. and and ronnie just felt like a fish out of water on those it sounded it just didn't sound like him yeah i i think i mean i think it's my you know it's my problem you know and, and mine too but uh but other other than that i mean you know, I, I don't really have any songs that, you know, I'd go, oh, man, if, you know, if I was a producer, I would have just said, uh-uh. Uh, they I just can to think me, of a few. Yeah, see, I, <laughs> you know, to me, they're, they're amazing. And all the ones to me on Holy Diver are just amazing. I to agree. Me. You know, they, those songs are just, wow. Yes. Uh, I, have a, I have a quick little amusing story about Holy Diver. So... My uh, sister was living in Chattanooga, and uh, she uh, she had just got married, and her and her husband were going to move to Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and I went up to stay with her for a couple of weeks uh, to help them move, and this was 1983, and uh, I had no idea. I, I, I guess I just didn't keep up with it, but I had no idea that Dio had left Sabbath. Well, like I said, it's not like it is now, you know. Right. And uh, when, while we were still in Chattanooga, she took me to a record store, and I bought a cassette tape of Women and Children First, and as I'm looking around at the records, I see Holy Diver, and I'm like... Oh my God! Very cool cover. Extremely cool, and I had to have it. It had to be mine. But here's the thing: I bought the album, the actual vinyl, vinyl. record, right? And 
they didn't have a turntable. Oh, oh wow. Okay. I held that album for two fucking weeks, not being able to hear it. Oh, wow. And when I finally got home, it was the literally the first thing I did was run upstairs, throw it on my turntable, and it sounded every bit as good as I thought it would for the last two freaking weeks. And it, oh, man, I love that record. Don't Talk to Strangers, just the best song ever. The, those songs on the album are the kind of songs that makes the hair stand up on your arms when you know it. And when you listen Dude, to his voice and things, I, I'm you know? getting chills just thinking yeah, about it. I mean, really, his voice, if you listen, you know, if you listen to that, and his lyrics are not like any lyrics anybody writes ever. He, uh, uh, that's what really sucked me into him, I think, was his l- really l- deep listening to the songs. And his uh, was just amazing. And, you know, another thing, his voice, uh, you know, there's plenty of, I mean, you know, the world is full of people that can sing. It, it really is. I mean, you know, uh, uh, not as many that can write but I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's like super easy. I'm just saying there's a, you know, there's a lot of people, so it, that you know that has wide range vocal abilities and stuff. But the, there's something um, unique about him, and on top of that, how he can instantly go from that that uh, angelic liquid sound, like you were talking about in Holy Diver. To a super aggressive vocal timber in the same, just within a, yeah. you know, in an instant almost, and ramp it up, uh, and 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 that, and you just like, wow, you know, it just goes, <laughs> it, it just blows me away. So That's the difference between a musician, an entertainer, and an artist. Yeah, he. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was lucky enough to, to, you know, meet him many times. I got to talk to him and, and you know, his wife and became friends with, uh, you know, Craig Goldie and Tracy G and worked with Tracy G on several projects. But um, I've never met anybody like Ronnie. I'll, I'll say that up front. He's like... Um, he. Uh, that stuff people that i've read about before but i've never met uh i heard i read that uh jfk was this way and and marilyn monroe and some people like that that had that charisma and uh, the magnetism right uh, uh about them and he had that he had that that uh th- thing whatever it is uh i sensed it many times uh, you, you would be in a room and not, you know, not be aware that he walked in, and you could feel his whatever you want to call it propagate across the room. His he had a very electric presence, right? And you know, he's a tiny guy. Yeah, but so it was. And what it mighty was, mouse? It was uh, very strange to to. I don't know, experience that, I guess. And he uh, was really intelligent. He read all the time, so he like knew something about everything. Uh, big historical buff, uh, huge sports fan. Uh, he, he was just... And the, the way he really, deep down, wholeheartedly appreciated his fans i've oh never God, experienced yeah. that with anybody else either uh uh you know and uh, now you've read a lot or anybody that's read much about him you know the, the, uh, all the good folks out there that that their livelihood depends on fans you know at some time realize that you know that that uh, keeps them alive right but but you know i mean come on you got to imagine you know every night shows traveling all the time you know you're tired whatever everybody has bad nights and you know you want to get on the plane you want to get on the bus and get some rest you got to go to another show you know 
uh, and and a lot of the times, and I saw this in person too. You know, Ronnie would stand out in the rain, signing autographs and talking with his fans, while everybody else is like, "Let's go!" You know, yeah. it's it's late, man. We got we got a show tomorrow, and you know that's kind of thing. But he would stay out there because uh, he just he, he had like a drive about it. Um, very unusual. The, uh, the only other musician I'd ever heard that was even close was Dimebag. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, another thing that I that that I have read about on some businessmen and a few politicians that are really successful is he had this weird ability to remember uh, faces, names, specifics about people. I will never be accused of that. Uh, you know, most most people, professional people, need a handler, need an assistant that, you know, when they're at a party or at a meeting or whatever, is, is there to tell them, like, oh, yeah, that's Senator so-and-so, or that's Joe Smith, and his wife's Jane, and they got two kids, and da-da, all this stuff, you know, where he can seem like he remembers them. Right. And you got to imagine somebody like Ronnie, you know, meeting thousands of people all the time all over the world uh, and I the the probably the second time you know because first time obviously you have no reference point the second time you know he, he when he remembers your name number one that shocks you uh, you know I think the first time it was maybe six months or a year and he immediately said hey Scott how's it going what you know how, you know I, I would have just I'd have shit myself and I was you know it's just like um, how does he do that? Uh, but but you know I, that's just the way he was, and uh, I never saw him forget anything like that either. So I, I you know I'm sure it had to happen. But to give you a story, as, as I ended up uh, naming one of my boys Ronnie James, and uh, so he uh, he met. Um, my wife that was pregnant at the time and she was obviously big pregnant uh, one of the many times at the sh at a show and you know he asked hey when's the baby due and uh, you know started talking about that well and you know went on and he, the next thing he says like well did you have you come up with any names now why he asked that I really don't know I guess just part of it making conversation and I sort of paused and I said you know we have actually and I said, we, we think we're going to call him Ronnie James. And he sort of stopped. And I wasn't sure how he was going to take it. Uh, and then he got that big Ronnie smile. And he says, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's really cool. But you need to name him something that's, you know, important to you or, you know, something. I forgot how he put it. And I said, well, listen, I'll, I'll, let me tell you how this came about. And uh, My wife had had... She was working as a secretary or assistant or something and doing transcribing stuff, typing and stuff. And she, anyway, she's answering phones and she had happened to have headphones on and, and a Walkman. For the, you guys don't know what Walkmans are, they're over like a little cassette. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, and she, uh, the phone rang and this is how you explain to me I wasn't there. She put, and she was listening to Holy Diver. And she put the headphones on her belly, right, uh, while she answered the phone, and that was the first time the baby kicked. So you know she came on that day and she told me about it, and I jokingly, you know, said like, "Oh, that is really cool. Maybe we should name him Ronnie James." You know, thinking <laughs> she would go, you know, "Hell no, we're not naming him Ronnie James. Are you crazy?" And she goes, "Oh, that that would be cool," and I was like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was the story I told Ronnie, and and finally, you know, he he just got this biggest grin, and he didn't really. He's like, okay, I I get it, you know. So anytime I talk to him after that, sometimes on the phone, you know, I see him after a show or whatever the case may be, he always said, "Hey Scott, how's little Ronnie Jr.?" And um, that's what he called him, Ronnie Jr. And um, <laughs> you know, I'd say, well, you know, he's whatever. And and one of the shows, you know, he was, I don't know how, he was probably a couple of years old by this point. 
So uh, he said, well, you should uh, you should get Carrie to, that was my wife, you should get Carrie to bring him to the, you know, let me see him, bring him to the show, after show or whatever. And I was like. He just wanted to see if he looked like him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's never, probably why he paused the first time. I, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, dude's setting me up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, you know, I, I call Carrie up and I said, hey, you know, Ronnie wants to meet uh, Ronnie. <laughs> so she's like, really? And I go, yeah. So, you know, she brought him. Of course, it was, you know, wasn't the best. He was just a little guy, but, you know, t- took pictures and everything. But uh, yeah, you know, it, ever since till till he wasn't around anymore. Anytime uh, he saw me or talked, uh, he always asked about Ronnie Jr. Uh, amazing dude. I'm getting sort of sad here thinking about it though. Um, Sorry. Yeah. I'll I'll I'll, I'll grab it for a sec. Yeah. So um, back in '87, uh, Michael Klein again. He worked at uh, WEGL down in Auburn when he was in school down there. And uh, he always got his tickets to shows. And he the, the coup was he scored us DO tickets. Birmingham Fairgrounds. Now, check out this bill. It was Sabotage opening for Megadeth opening for DO. Wow. And it was, let's see, it was Sabotage's Hall of the Mountain King tour. Yeah. It was Megadeth's So Far, So Good, So What tour. And it was Ronnie's Dream Evil. And uh, so we watched the Sabotage set, um, which was great. And then we had an interview with the uh, lead singer. So we went directly after their set to do the interview. Uh, John Oliva back then had some serious issues. <laughs> Big cokehead, you know, all that. I mean, Michael handed him one of his cards and he rolled it right up and snorted a line with it. And uh, and no. the inter- and it was a decent interview up until uh, the roadie showed up with some girls and then introduced John as Ronnie Dio. Oh, he got so livid. Oh, wow. So we go back into the show, and it was uh, about a third of the way through Megadeth set, and we watched the rest of it, and then we prowled around the backstage for a little while, and then we sat up and watched the entire Dio show, which was just absolutely amazing. So after the show, we go backstage again, and that was my chance to meet the man. And I froze up. As soon as I saw him, I froze up. Because he was livid mad. He was pissed off. And he was pissed because all we could hear was that the audience was dead. And he was, he just could not get them fired up. And his tour manager was going, Ronnie, we're in Birmingham, Alabama, and they just saw a rock concert where a robot dragon and a robot spider had a laser fight in front of them. They had no effing clue how to act. You just blew them away. And wow. that and that seemed to satiate him. He, he felt a little better about it at that point, but up until that point, he... I've never seen somebody so mad. Well, I mean, I've seen him mad a couple of times, but he, he you know, most of the time he he would get mad at uh, things that he thought interfered with the audience's experience. You know, he, he didn't, he was such a perfectionist and, and very, and, and you know, he, like, stupid mistakes you know equipment failures or anything like that right he, he you know are 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 people doing things that stupid things okay you know he, he didn't really have a you know but 
I always saw him, anytime I saw him, he was just great with anybody that he worked with unless they fucked up. Right. Uh, he, did, he just didn't really tolerate that a lot. And, and the way he looked at it was, uh, he, he, it wasn't a personal thing. It didn't seem to me. It was that he wanted the audience to have the best, you know, their money's worth and the best experience possible, you know, right. about it. Um, but yeah, I'd never seen him, like you said, just livid, you know. Um, well, it's, he, he went out there. I, let, me, let me say that I could not imagine a better show. I'm oh shit. Hang on, the late great Cozy is is schooling us here. I got a um, I got a story about this uh, album too. But anyway, so uh, I mean, there was really nothing that anybody could even remotely fault that show for because it was just absolutely stellar but everybody was just slack jawed because they weren't expecting that and they'd seen they'd seen like the the um, forum show VHS right you know and they they probably heard a couple of bootlegs here and there but when you see it I mean, because it was literally just absolutely fantasy. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was a very cool show. It was the first time I ever heard Craig Goldie play uh, in person, and he just absolutely nailed it. He, uh, he, uh, he, and believe it or not, most people, you know, have different uh, favorites, different opinions. Uh, but Craig is my favorite deal guitarist, not just because he's a super nice guy and I'm friends with him and all that because I, even if it didn't he still would be he he's he has uh well it, you you can probably tell it in his playing but Richie is one of his mentors okay you know that's it, that's who he you know. right I will not I Viv will always be my favorite right a lot of folks he is I mean Viv is he was amazing but Craig was probably the my most respected because he came up you know when he was in rough cut um that era of the 80s was the guitar shredder era right and he came up to prominence without using tremolo which is ungodly for the time frame i don't anybody else not use tremolo i, I did I mean, uh, he was one of the new shredders. Yeah. And he didn't use tremolo. I mean, he just had that much talent to compete with the big boys. Or well, the reason I think uh, uh, that I like him so much, with, besides the personal side of him that that I'm sure influenced me, but before I knew that, it, it, and, and it's that he. Uh, and and I well, I talked to him about this, and I don't think and he acted surprised. I don't think anybody else ever said it. That he reminded me, even though Richie is his like favorite guitarist, and you know uh, you can imagine playing Richie songs in a band that the singer co-wrote. And, I mean right. that kind of th- effect. But uh, is that he reminded me of a clone of Tony and Richie? You know uh, they. Because Craig has that uh, chunky, heavy rhythm too that he can yeah. do. But he can, well-rounded. But he, but he can fluid, liquid do the do the Blackmore stuff. And to me, Blackmore is a I call a noodler. You know, he's not a he's not really a rhythm player. Okay, I mean, you know, Agreed. not like Tony is. You know, I mean, come on, that's like God. The Rip playing. Lord. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, you know, so that's, he, he, and, and to me it worked out great because obviously when you're in a band and you got such a wide range of songs you're going to be playing, some of them written by the riff master himself and played by him and then written by your favorite guitarist Blackmore and then you know and Vivian and whoever I mean so uh, and he he just nailed that shit uh, and he also wrote 
you know, co-wrote some of my favorite riffs and songs in the deal era. I think Dream Evil is a very underrated album. Um, I've tried to steal that riff several times. It's just, that album is really cool stuff. The only thing I have against it, if I have anything at all against it, is due to the time period, and I said this to Ronnie, too, one time, and I felt bad. I still feel bad about it. And at the time, I said, I felt like I stuck my foot in my mouth, but I said, you know, I love that album. If the only thing that I have could say is it's a little 80s sounding, you know, like it's dated. Yeah, it's got that 80s uh, production on it. Uh, and 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 when I said it, you know, I sort of saw his face fall a little bit or like change. And I went, oh, that's that was just stupid. And he goes, well, he said, that's you're right. That it's that's my fault. Uh, you know, and I didn't know what to say, and he, cause he said, I produced it, you know. And I was just like, oh, what an idiot, you know. I was like, <laughs> but the thing was. I'm sure he appreciated the honesty, though. I hope so. The the, the thing about, too, is uh, I luckily later got to see them bring those songs back into the set list with Craig playing them live right. several times and I w- and I had talked to Craig about I'm sure it had nothing to do with it but I had talked to Ronnie and Craig both about it you know and I, I have another little story about that too but um, they live they sounded like they should have they were heavy and you know not they didn't right. sound like that on the album they sounded way better and I was like wow too bad we can't had a live release or something have you know because it, it, you know not that that album's bad okay and there's a reason the th- same thing with mob rules that we we're talking about that i found out years later emotionally how they how the the participants in the album don't exactly feel the same way about that album as they do heaven and hell a lot of emotional baggage going on there well the same right. thing with dream evil because I asked Ronnie one I was like, why? You know, I love that album. Why don't you play songs off of that album? And he, and I said, they're great songs. And he goes, yeah, they are. But there's a, there's just some, you know, a lot of things were going on in, in our lives during the time. And it colored, I think, yeah, uh, our feelings about that. And we just, a lot of us didn't want to play, you know, some same guys were in the band that were on that, you know, so we just didn't really want to play those songs. And I was like, wow, you know, uh, you know, this sure would be cool to have some of those songs back in there. Yeah. Well, you know, fast forward a couple of years and uh, there was, uh, there was, the band had done that, you know, had sort of like their fan uh, club or whatever, you know, they ask about what songs you know, on this tour do you want to hear, you know, and and several people had put, you know, the dream, some of the Dream Evil stuff, and of course I did, and had talked to both Craig and Ronnie about that, and uh, so it was great when I went to see them and they played some of those songs, and I was just like, yes, you know, they just sound so badass too. So I talked to both of them after after a couple of shows of seeing them. And I said, man, it was so great, you know, seeing those songs back in the set list. And he goes, you were right. He said, it's long, it's far enough now that I don't have the same, that that emotional stuff that, that was bothering me. He never said specifically what it was, but it's not there anymore. Right. Those were great songs. They're fun to play. I, I, you know, I, 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 I really regret all those years that we didn't play them. Uh, and it's a shame because they would have probably ended up on some live right. releases too. But, but you know, this for the same reason, you know, you were absolutely right about Dream Evil being dated sounding. But that was what I loved about Magica is that it was a throwback to that sound. And we had been without it for too long. Yeah. I think Magica is raw. Uh, it, than the than Dream Evil is, but maybe not sound wise as much as oh you're talking I, I about, alluded to, yeah, but the songwriting yeah. I got you was yeah. was you're absolutely right with that yeah 
because yeah. uh, Magica blew me away, and I was so, so happy to have that out. Yeah, yeah that's an underrated album. Uh, this, this While this song was playing here, I, I, I got to mention it. Did you recognize this song? It's on Dream Evil. It's called Overlove. Yeah. Listen to the intro. had a couple of lessons dude that's badass i mean it's 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 very reminiscent of man on the silver mountain but it's he's i mean he he made it his own and just uh, tapped he, that vein <laughs> we were uh it's weird too because the reason i paused there to do that because that song it's it's really cool song and I don't know. I don't think I ever saw him play that live. I don't know if they ever did or not. But because that's that's Craig doing the right, you know, the guitar work, obviously, and um, I think shows how you know great a player he is. Yes. But okay. So fast forward, Scotty, my son, one of my sons, you know, um, Mr. Thunderfoot. Well, he was he was working on some guitar tunes and. Uh, you know, a couple off of um, Lock Up the Wolves, he really grabbed him, you know. Uh, Evil on Queen Street and uh, lo- uh, I think the title track or whatever. But anyway, Overload, Overlord, Overlove, Overlove. He, uh, he's like, man, that, I'd like to be able to play that, but I, you know, I couldn't find any, any way to, so anyway, he says, hey, why don't you ask Craig? <laughs> You know, and I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I called him up and I said, hey, Craig, you know, my son Scotty, he's blah, 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 you know, and he was wanting to, to, uh, to, uh, work up over, over love. And he goes, oh my God, I don't remember how to play it. <laughs> and, you know, and, <laughs> cause I, you know, like I said, I don't think they played it live. So, you know, he probably, they did it for the album and that's, you know, uh, and I'm sure he, you know he could probably sit down and do it, but oh yeah. But I was just thinking, you know, he would like go, oh yeah, I'll just send you the, you know, tabs or whatever. But it's like I don't even think I can play. You know, I don't remember how to play that. Isn't that crazy? But I thought that was, you know, really funny. Okay, uh, what I was going to talk before about, you know, we were talk- talking about Ronnie's favorite um, is not favorite. There's another thing I ask him about. <laughs> Uh, because just like you talked about on uh, Stargazer, um, most folks, I would say, ninety plus percentage of the people that you know are fans uh, like Rainbow, especially. Anyway, that's like they're you know they go, wow, you know that album right. is just rising. That's just amazing. and I'm one of know, those people. Yeah. yeah, Stargazer, wow, that's just amazing. And you know, there's nothing. I, I don't argue with that at all, okay? Good. But my favorite Rainbow album is the first one. No doubt. And you're a uh, famous first album lover. The reason, I think, is number one, uh, that was the group, you know, that Richie hired, basically, you know. Right. I mean to you know and it, to go in and do that 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 was sort of a hand pick type thing and um the production is better uh on that oh this is such an amazing song the um Uh, the production, I just like it. It's just cleaner. It's just better for some reason. Uh, that's another thing I have with Rainbow in during Ronnie's era. As the albums progress, for whatever reason, I don't know. In my opinion, the production gets worse and worse. Um, um, uh, uh, long Live Rock and Roll, to me, is horrible production. 
muddy, oh, it's, muddy and, and it's, uh, and I don't know, it, but anyway. It has moments. I, I love it. I love the album. I'm just, right. We're talking about strictly a production here. Um, so, anyway, and, and there's some songs on it to me that, on the first album that are just epic, like Temple of the King. Uh, catch the rainbow, right. you know. Th- those songs are right. just, you know, um, amazing. Ron, some of best, some of Ronnie's best vocal work to me. I mean, it's just really good. So, you know, I was curious um, to what Ronnie thought because I, to be honest, I'd never uh, talked to anybody that felt the same way I did about it. Everybody always said, "Yeah, it's a great album." Blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, Rising just blows it away. Sorry, you know, all this. Okay, and I, I, you know, I sort of built it up a little bit with him, you know. And, and as I'm doing it, he's getting that smile again. He's right. smiling at me, and I thought he's just gonna, it's gonna be something, whatever. I, I didn't know what he was gonna say, and, and I stopped, and he's like, "Scott, you're absolutely right." He says. There are several reasons that the first album is better. <laughs> he goes, of course, you know, that's subjective, but I mean, I think it's better. That's, you know, that's what he's saying. Uh, he says, number one, that's my band. Those guys I grew up with. I, I've been playing with those guys. For, right. know, that was Elf, minus the guitarist, you know. Yeah. Those were my bud. Those were my, forgot how he said it. Uh, but, um, so... And he says, there's nothing uh, that I can say, you know, that the, that Rising was an amazing album. You know, there's just, oh, he said, I, I really like it. But I feel it's a little bit, and I think he said masturbatory or something. You know, it was something like, it was a little, uh, um, yeah, you know, uh, the songs are longer, jams, you know, showing off. And, you know, some, you know, he, he felt it, it was a little... A little of that, and I and I he didn't say, you know, really himself, but I he led me to believe that 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 was Richie, you know. Oh yeah, you know. So I think it's I think it's also relevant to say that you know he's in a band with Richie freaking Blackmore, who doesn't need an excuse to solo for twelve days straight, and often did. But, and that would get on his nerves, or that would definitely put an impression in his head. But then he goes and starts playing with Tony. And recently, just recently, Tony shared that Ronnie was the kind of guy that was like, Why don't you play the solo longer? You know, and it's just a completely different attitude. And I think that says something about Tony. And Richie, because uh, because well, like you were saying earlier, Richie was a noodler, whereas Tony, when he he's structured, even when he's off the cuff, uh, his solos get are just amazing. And I'm I'm sure that Ronnie, I you know I never had a chance to ask him, but I bet you he could sit there and listen to it all day. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I you know I think. Uh, uh, I think Tony was his favorite, no doubt. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I I remember asking him about uh, because you know the split with Rainbow wasn't exactly you know the best. Uh, after that, you know he, he he and Wendy were you know living in their car basically, no money and that kind of thing. So. Um, you know, and the because the house they were living in was the bands, and, and you know all that stuff. And and he took a big gamble to quit. You know, he he didn't he didn't have to, right? Uh, but uh, he decided to. And of course, you know, you know, looking back, it was it was, it was, it was the best right. Decision. Yeah, it was great. But you know, at the time, I I really don't see how he did it. You know. Um, because I mean Richie Blackmore, you know, you, you you don't you don't think about it now, and because Rainbow was never that huge in the U.S. as it was in the rest of the world, right? But Richie Blackmore was like 
the biggest guitarist in the world. He I was, mean, the, he was the Van Halen yeah. of his time. Yeah, yeah. right. The, you know, Deep Purple. I mean, you know, so uh, you know that, that that's that's a whole that's a whole another aspect of that. Um, and I asked him, you know, uh, I says, uh, you know, because Richie had. Uh, recently, you know, because he went through that uh, big old period, didn't even want to play rock, you know, and he's just like playing medieval stuff, and right? And his wife, and you know, which which I liked that a lot of that stuff, but I mean, you know, he was just really wouldn't even talk about purple or anything and uh, rainbow. Or, so um, he had he had recently talked some in an interview or something about you know that that he was you know he would be open to doing some stuff like that and i and i mentioned i said would you ever work with richie again you know and he sort of paused and he said yeah you know yeah I'd, yeah I'd, you know i'd do some stuff with richie but i think it was obvious that that wasn't gonna happen no <laughs> but, <laughs> it's easy to answer that one yeah yeah uh, i'll say yes but it doesn't yeah. mean a thing but you know yeah i, I you know so, so the whole point of that, I guess, was that I I was surprised again that that <laughs> was that freak wasn't that freaking out or something? Yeah, that the fur you know that nobody I knew thought the same way I did about the Rainbow albums and the man that co-wrote them did, you know? Yeah. I was surprised again that he felt, you know, he felt that same way. Um, because everybody wanted to talk to him about Stargazer and right. I mean, you know, right. You know, really, that's, that was, you know, if they want to talk rainbow, that was what they, maybe Man on Silver Mountain, you know, or Long Live Rock and Roll, that album, but whatever. But yeah, so um, that, uh, that surprised me. All right, so because we're getting yeah, we're long getting, in the tooth. I'm good. Yeah. Let's let's end this way. What's your favorite song on the first album? First on the yeah. first Rainbow album, sorry. See, so yeah, it's just I, uh, Come on, man. I don't I don't know if I can do it. Uh it's hard for me to do that my favorite song anything because they're when you've got, you know, it's like you know, I have Lucy Lawless here and I <laughs> She's in her Xena outfit. I think. And, you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. And I'm going, he goes, which one do you... You know, I'm not going to say who else, but, you know, you got you to gotta choose. And I'm like, uh, can I choose both? I, you know, I, I can't really pick. So it's really... Yeah, wow. It's well, just hard. What, what's it down between then? <sighs> Temple of the King and... It's probably Temple of the King. I knew I'd get it out of you. Because... There, if you listen to that song, and and I'm definitely not tonight, obviously looks like, but because uh, we haven't played any songs really, uh, but that's the next episode. Yeah, there's so much going on in that song. There's like five or six guitars at least, you know, acoustic guitar, right. twelve string, electrics, you know, all kind of stuff. There's just a lot of things going on. The arrangement's amazing in it, and Ronnie's vocals are the same way. They're like all he's doing all kind of harmonies with himself and all kind of stuff. Man, it's right. crazy. I mean, it's my favorite too. It, it's and and then the the feel of the song. You know uh, the, that feeling that you get if you when you really listen to a song, not just hear it. You know, it is is something else. So, what's your favorite on Rising? You know, <laughs> Stargazer is a good song. Okay, it's a great song. Uh, it's uh, not my favorite, but it's still transformative. But the the you know the. But I think overall, it's probably one of my favorite on there. I can't say it's, you know, the favorite. The favorite. Uh, but the, I mean, come on, it, the drum intro by itself is like, oh, is I mean, a masterpiece. Absolutely. So uh, it could you know, the song could have been over at the end of that that intro. You and, know, that's like a a Zeppelin type uh, drum part. What what's your favorite? Terrell Woman. Yeah, I, like, I absolutely adore that song. I mean, I like it, uh, but that wouldn't be my favorite. I know. Fine. Oh. 
<laughs> but at least I can name one. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh. Did you ever, you know, this album here is, is Lock Up the Wolves is what's playing in the background. And it was with um, um, Rowan. Yeah. What's his first name? Rowan is his first name. Rowan Robertson. Yeah. Right? Um, 17 they, years old. Yeah, yeah. They like auditioned thousands of guitarists and, you know, a 17 year old kid and got the gig. And, and this album is so different to me than a lot of, and, and a lot of people don't care for it. A lot of DO people uh, don't care for it. And it's super underrated. Agreed. But I, I mean, this song, Wild One, Hey Angel, come on. Evil on Queen Street to me is oh. is like wow, but this is like it's very Sabbathy. This album is yeah. like Lock Up the Wolves is a good example. It's plotting. It's that what I like about Sabbath. All right, you all right. Know? I got to say this. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the other podcast, but um, well, I don't care. Huh? <laughs> um, Martin Popoff. Yeah, who, if you know if you know who Martin is, Martin writes a thousand books yeah, I, about I, every band you can imagine. I read a bunch of his stuff, and uh, and he did an episode on his uh, five songs that made history or something like that. Uh, he did it uh, on slow songs, and when he's when I say slow songs, slow tempo, right? And he said. He was always bothered by the fact that Dio's, the majority of Dio's songs, were slow. Had, I've heard that. And uh, I slap him when he says stuff like that. But go ahead. And then he asked him why, and he was like, "Because there's so much room to play. It makes them heavier. It makes them heavier, and he has so much room mm -hmm. to maneuver. And can you name a song that he doesn't?" I mean, he was the master of it. Well, you notice the pattern, you know, and I and we've talked about this before. I don't like setting uh, patterns or restrictions on songs, you know, like when you're writing them or whatever. Like, well, we need to do a fast song. We need to do a battle. We need to do this. Right. I, I don't like that whole thing. But that's the way it was, you know, when you're doing an album, especially back in the album days. And you notice all the first tracks were fast. Yeah. You know, okay. You got, uh, well, uh, what is it? It was Wild One, the first one. I believe it is on yeah. this one. Uh, Heaven and Hell is... Uh, uh, Neon Nights. Right. You know, that, it's just... Turn fast, up the night. Right. It's fast tempo, you know. that That's the way the, the people at the label wanted you to come out of the thing. They want the... the uh, the OTT, the over the top song. Right. So those were always my least favorite songs. See, so that's you know, I I would always go to the second song first. That would be the heaven and hell. That would be the you know that would be the what uh you know uh, lock up the wolves or whatever. I mean you know the the holy diver. I think second song on holy diver, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but stand up and shout. Yeah, is the is, fast the one. OTT right. is just right. a great song. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's not, but that right, one. Right. You know, I again, I I've always felt the same way. This song to me is way heavier. Oh, God, the, yes. The guitar work and all the little air in there. You right. know that those starts and stops. You know that draws me in but again a lot of people i've talked to whether they're musicians or just casual listeners they don't feel that way they like fast tempo songs yeah uh and i do like like fast tempo songs too but i'm just saying they're you know not as heavy generally they you just can't i don't know it's just different uh and that's what always sucked me in about bands like sabbath you know i like plotting and not, you know, some people will look at that term plotting in a bad sense. But Sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's... Because I, I, he... Space in a song can can transfer power. Plain and simple. Well, it's all dynamics, you know. Exactly. That, you got that difference between dark and light, you know, and... To me, that's listen. To this this is another. This is you know not only the 
subject matter and the riff, amazing riffs and all and the and the the drum everything about it is cool on this song to me. But listen how plodding that is. Oh yeah. That could be a Sabbath song right there. You can see Tony playing that. <laughs> Come on, you right. know. So, you know. And I was surprised he got that kind of performance out of Simon. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's another story, too. You know, si uh, I remember that whole thing with, uh, with Vinny, you know. Because Vinny was a master of that tempo. Vinny. Uh, Him and Bill are the only ones that could play it. I think, if I remember correct at the time, this was when Vinny went to sit in the wings for Bill in case something happened. Right. And Simon is a friend, personal, or was, or what are you going to call it, of Ronnie, you know. But right. he hadn't, they hadn't really played together. Uh, and I won't take this back. That's This is not how this went because the times don't match up right. Uh, it, that did happen, but it was on tour. You know, Vinny was touring and left, and Simon came in to, you know, take over. Right. He, and because he, and, you know, he was in ACDC for a while and some other bands. Rhino Bucket, which is an ACDC clone band. I don't know if you, I was trying to think of them the other day, and I couldn't think of their name. He um, even did a Priest album. Right. So, anyway. And I, you know, I, and I remember talking to Simon at the time uh, at, at the show. This was pre, they were, the show wasn't started. We, we, I was hanging out at the show. It might have been the show I worked. Uh, and Simon and I were like resting on the, watching, I don't know, the roadies or something. I don't remember what it was. And, 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 uh, and, um, you know, I th he either introduced me to himself to me or something. I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, I said, uh, no, I think I did. I think I started something like, uh, you know, um, it, it was great that you were able, free that you could come in and help Ronnie out, uh, you know, because Vinny, you know, Bill, I think what it, at the time, Bill had actually had a heart attack. That's what it was. And they, they, and they were in the middle of touring, so Vinny flew to overseas and, you know, jumped in and played for him so uh you know which i think hurt ronnie's feelings a little bit to be honest with you you know leaving in the middle of the tour and you know sort of leaving him in a lurch that right. was my impression at the time i'm just remembering that so i'm not sure but uh you know and simon's simon if at that time if i remember correctly talking to me he had a pretty thick accent yeah and uh I think it's like Scottish or Irish or some kind of you know, yeah. really thick brogue. I think he's and, Scottish. And, you know, and, and I was, you know, having a little bit of difficulty, you know, conversing with him. It was really thick. Um, and, you know, he said, yeah, you know, yeah, I hope I haven't heard. I hope Bill's okay. You know, he's a, he's a good bloke, you know, or something like that, you know. And then we started talking about other stuff. But uh, I don't know why I brought this up. Because you could. But Simon... Uh, I think did very well. oh yeah UFO too yeah because he you know he he was talking about he when he was telling me he goes yeah you know I was I did I was on tour with UFO and and I was I, I don't know what my look was but he's like oh you know UFO like you know he's like explain <laughs> I was like well, I know what UFO is you know it's like uh, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's a really nice dude. And I, I think, uh, you know, obviously he's got a different style. He's, uh, I don't know, more ACDC style. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a typical drummer. Less, I don't think I've is, ever heard him do anything atypical. Less is more type drummer. Okay? Right. You know, like, uh, if he's if he plays something, it needs to be there. It's like... I think know. the only thing I've heard him play that was surprising was the intro to Starbreaker. Oh, really? Yeah. Um... 
I think his playing uh, with Dio on this album and and later stuff, uh, it, you know, I don't know if it was a conscious thing or not, but he, you know, he he, be, there's some feels on here that reminds me of Vinny. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, you know, and again, it's because of the tempos. But you got to do something. Vinny uh, sometimes played over the top. Okay, I, you know, I, he was uh, he's one of my favorite drummers, but especially live, watching him uh, as many times as I've seen him live, you know, he takes chances, which yeah. is cool. Sometimes when you take chances, you know, you don't always do it. I mean, you know, he would miss, he'd come out of a fill or something, and he what he didn't quite make it. Because he took a little chance there, he played it different, he played you know, and he was like a. You remember the last in line video with the Borg? Yeah, <laughs> I call yeah. Him the Borg. And he's sitting there playing with the the drums like caveman looking, yeah. you know. That that's what Vinny reminds me of, of that kind of drummer. You know, he he's a heavy hitter. Uh, not a lot of finesse, but he has cool feels that I think are trademarked and were, you know, awesome on the Dio stuff. I mean, and that that I call it his uh, kick drum shuffle. It's just I, I, yeah, he's I the know. only one I know that can do that. Yeah, I don't that that stuff on the Dio albums. I still can't hardly explain it either. I'm sure there's terms for, it, but he's he's got that shuffle thing, and he, you think. That that would just be paid like a straight beat, a straight four on the floor thing. But he's doing something. That's it's a little, just, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and, and it's usually ride. He's got a, he's got the ride in there, and he's and and it's just like grooving like hell. And you're just like, hold, how's, what the fuck is that? You know, it's like <laughs> but, going going back to the uh, Rainbow in the Dark. That's the only way I can listen to that song is just to listen to Vinny because I hate that song. <laughs> The but drum I, parts, the but drum I, parts are cool. That bum bum, boom bum. You know? Exactly, it's the only way I can get <laughs> through that man. song. <laughs> it's the only way. Uh, why do you hate it? Because it, for the same reason that Dio hates it, it's too damn poppy. Well, he didn't. He he. he all right, all right, all right. Came to like it. All right. You know, he probably bought him a bunch of houses every and cars. every single solo Dio song that sounds like pop. I don't like. I don't like Rainbow in the Dark. I don't like um, Mystery. Um, What's your least favorite Dio solo album? Where too far? We're gonna. I'll let it go an hour and a half here because we'll cut some out maybe. Solo album. Um, I don't think I can answer this, but I just wondered if you had an answer. My least favorite would probably be Strange Highways. Your your. Uh, favorite my favorite is last in line what what would be your least favorite not tracy g not tracy g um master of the moon uh i don't like sacred heart no i take that back i like master of the moon better than i liked killing the dragon and and I absolutely adore Doug Aldridge, but the songs weren't there. Push, come on, man, come on. You know, I met Doug uh, at a Dio show in Atlanta when when Craig got hurt, hurt his hand or something. And you know, Doug's a uh, sort of a hired hand type guy. You know, hope you get better, Doug. And yeah, that's right. And uh, <clears throat> and so Doug was there, and again I, we were hanging out, you know, and and nobody knew who he was. Okay, you know, like the normal folks, because I mean he wasn't in, he hadn't been in the band. Okay, right. I knew who he was, uh, you know. So I was like, man, I want to go over and talk. You know, he was just like standing over there, you know, like no, and no, you know. And I felt sorry for him, really, you know, right. like it was just stupid, but I did. So I, I like sort of went over and hey, hey, dude, how's it going? He goes, hey. I said, uh, you know, how you doing? Oh, uh, you know, pretty cool. And, you know, he, and he reminded me of like uh, a stereotypical Southern gentleman type guy, right? Real laid back, humble. 
you know, super talented, of course, you know. I mean, he right. can play anything. He's been in White Snake and, you know, I mean, Def Leppard won it or whatever. I don't know who all he No, he played. wasn't in Leopard. Wasn't he? <laughs> I mean, you can drop him anywhere, and I think he could just play anything. Yeah. But I remember, uh, like, he flew into there, and the and only thing he had with him was his guitar, you know, on plane. He took brought his guitar on plane with him. Um, but we we started talking about you know stuff. I said you know like how is it like jumping in? Yeah, you know, <laughs> like yeah. That, you know. And he says you know he said oh, sometimes it can be a little rough. And he said but these guys you know he said Ronnie's like they don't tell me that but he's like you know he's like the nicest guy ever you know I mean. Uh, so Doug, you know. That tour for Killing the Dragon, even though I didn't care for the album, that was probably one of his best touring bands. They were super tight, man. Man, I, I, Doug I, and Rudy Sarzo yeah. and uh, Rudy. You know, I like Rudy. Rudy's a nice guy and a great player, but he's a, he's a little Richie Blackmoreish for me. It's a little you flaky at I, times. You know what I'm saying? Like, and not personally. Like Richie, but right. Uh, but yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, I think the best the the best time, and I and like I said, I've seen Dio, whether it was in Heaven and Hell. Look at that; that's catching me when I say that. Um, you know, I saw uh, Heaven and Hell in the Radio City Music Hall in New York City that they right. recorded it and got the video and all that. I was there. But I, I've seen him a whole bunch. I don't even know how many times I've seen him. I think I can remember most of them. But, but uh, my point is the best time I saw him live was with Craig. And the, when they... I think they were playing... I think it was Magica that time. Okay. But they, but they were, you know, I know for a while they they did some shows where they just played the whole album like a concept. But this wasn't one, of, you know, this was like they they were putting, uh, they, you know, the Dream Evil. They were they were playing a bunch of Dream Evil songs too, and the regular Dio songs. And they were just all, you know, I think Jimmy Bain was, and um, I can't remember if it was Simon or Vinny, to be honest with you, but. They were just like super tight, right? I mean, uh, and I saw them in Atlanta one time um, at the that place that's not there anymore. It was a the metro. Meal. No, it was the it was like a mill had big wheels in it. It was wooden, and they had I know what you you know what I'm talking about. What was it? it? Had a like upstairs and a down hell, you know, and a heaven, and they called it. And I can't think that of that was the metro. No, uh, it started with an M, but it wasn't Metro. Anyway, I saw him there, and I had a photo pass there, so I was the whole show between the barrier and the stage, you know, and right there with the security guys. <laughs> and they just, dist I was just distracted a lot. I got some cool pictures, uh, but I should have gotten more because they were so, King's X opened for them too, which by oh. the way, of all the bands I've ever seen in my whole life were one of the tightest live bands I've ever seen. I don't know if they're always that way or not, but... They are. Wow. They were super tight. I mean, that's... It's... Not to get off on a completely stupid tangent, but they never hit it, but they're every band's favorite band. They they blew me away. I couldn't believe how tight they're. And they're a three-piece. Yep. Uh, and, and Doug plays a... Uh, a 12 string bass what album is this on that's uh what? stop it fever dreams that's on magica yeah that's an underrated album I know you it say is. It, you know a lot of people don't uh, don't care for that album but it, it's got as some. long as it's not about love my favorite song on that one Oh man, that's another. That's another sad story. Uh, amazing song. A lot of feels. A lot of feels in that song. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ronnie quit doing it because 
and I experienced it maybe once or twice. I think he only played it once or twice live, and it uh, didn't get a good reaction. He had a bunch of assholes in the audience, you know, that were like... They were from the, Birmingham. Yeah, uh, you know, like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? And, you know, you know the song, it's it's like... You know, it's not like a typical Dio song, okay? If no, it's there, not. If there is such a thing. And um, and he and I think it hurt his feelings, and he said, you know, obviously they don't like it, so we're not doing that anymore. And I, I was like, man, you know. But I experienced it at least once that I remember. I couldn't blame him. You know, it was it was it was sort of brutal. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll wrap this up. We can, I mean, obviously, uh, you're almost as bad as me. You can, we could just keep going on with this. And we uh, will. Uh, yeah, got to continue because I've got a lot more stories that I haven't even touched on. Uh, you know, I worked the show, worked the D.O. show as crew. Uh, that was really cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know there's some other stories. And I haven't got to talk about my favorite songs. I mean, yeah, we haven't really played <laughs> any songs and and, no. and and talked about them, so we haven't even gone there. Uh, but but uh, you know, another thing too is it's hard. Uh, I, I'm sure you probably run across this. You know, you're wearing the Dio shirt tonight too, so that's cool. But that you know, that there's people out there that don't really know who he is. You know, a sacrilege. Uh, or, you know, like who's this Dio person? Yeah. Or, uh, or who's that old man in uh, Pick of Destiny? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is an amazing scene there. That that still sort of does something to me when I see that. Yeah, and I love the story about him coming in to record. Oh yeah, and and the they could yeah they couldn't get the sound, and he was like, "Well, let me just plug up my mic that I brought, and you said I we didn't need, and boom, there yeah, was Dio." Jack, yeah, I would like to hear the real story instead of the Jack Black version, though. You know that Jack's like, "It's a, it's a, you know, it's a syllabus four sixty one, you know, and it's like an expensive mic, and you know, it was an EV, wasn't it? Uh, no, I'm just saying. He, he, I mean, he, I, he, he's making up. He's making up the. But they. The, I, I now I was watching where he came into right. the studio, and I think it was an EV mic, and I was like, "Huh." But, but I'm saying it, the Jack story was yeah. like he was, yeah, he's he's made, he, you know, because he's not really a technical guy, you know, he didn't right. know any of that stuff. And he's just like, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's uh, there's some other little things too that you know, yeah, and, and I tell you what, it's cool that uh, uh, I'm sure you heard uh, Jack in his. You know, in the in his show that they used to do Dio stuff. You know that. Yeah, and he even had a song called Dio. And uh, and so that intro to was it Push that mm -hmm. they shot in mm -hmm. L.A. You know where you know he, he's he's playing him and uh, Kyle are yeah. playing. What are they playing? We can't say Kyle's name anymore. He's canceled. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Fuck that, Kyle. So anyway, they're out there. What are they playing? Is it uh, holy? Is it uh, heaven and hell or something? I believe it's heaven and hell, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, you know, and he's like, "Why don't you play some some of your shit?" You know? Sing me a song, you're a singer. Pass me the bong, you're a bringer of reefer. The devil is never a maker. I think that he's coaching the Lakers. Now it's on and on and on. It's tenacious deep. I can see. I have something for you boys. If you play some tenacious D. He walks up. But anyway. Okay. Wow. 
Is that not sound like Blackmore? Yeah, very much so. Now it's turning into Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, but... Could be Rainbow Easy. Yeah. I'm sure that was by accident. Yeah. What do you mean, what's the problem? We had a, a Stonehenge set that was being trampled by dwarves. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. It's uh, it's getting late. It's almost tomorrow. Do you know it's almost tomorrow? I don't need to hear that. Yeah, because you you don't. Well, you don't have to get up and go to work, right? No, but I would. I was kind of looking forward to having it tomorrow, and <laughs> gotcha. And now it looks like I'm not, because I'm going to sleep. Uh, what's that? So I've heard of this sleep stuff, man. I don't know. Yeah. I think sleep's overrated. I think it's a rumor started by your burritos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jack. Where Jack sleeps 27 hours a day. You know, what, what, what was the line? I always thought um, it's a cool line we talked about this other day that uh, Van Zant uh, did in one of my favorite Skinner songs. Um, um, I, I I work seven days a week, eight when I'm able. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Anyway, yeah. <clears throat> all right. Anyway, we'll wrap it up and uh, and hopefully we'll see you guys next time and finish this up. I I don't you know to maybe be honest, I don't maybe. think we finish this up next time. There's too much to talk about. And I, hope I hope you understand how much we love Ronnie James Dio. Yes. Um. I don't really think anybody can quite grasp it. Um, you know, and I'm not one to be, uh, I don't really give a shit about most celebrity type. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, you know. I, I, the, if I'd have been pushed up to him and actually spoke to him, I probably would have got arrested. I wish... <laughs> I wish everybody <laughs> I wish everybody had got a chance to uh you know see him perform. Oh yeah. Because that's the thing about uh him, you know, he never canceled shows. He he every show, even his worst show would, you know, would blow you away better than most. Right. Best. He uh he always had an amazing band whatever uh you know and it was just it it, it he was just an amazing guy. So um uh, it's hard to describe. There's just no way, really, to describe uh, the experience. And then uh, talking to him personally and stuff too is he's, he was an amazing dude. Like I said, I've never met anybody quite like him before, uh, since, before, after anything. But okay, I keep saying we're wrapping it up, and I just keep jabbering and jabbering. So I will say, play the theme song. Yeah, we're gonna go out with the same theme song. Since my phone, I don't know what's happened over here to the phone. Oh, that's because I turned it off. <laughs> wow, that was good timing, though. I'm wasn't it? Amazing. Wow, man, I'm good. like but i want to keep going i want i want to do it one more time please can we do it one more time later guys see you next week probably <laughs>